Hello all, Kadrina here. Today we're going to be reviewing one of the February 2019 Book of the Month book. For anyone who's following this, I did not get a January 2018 Book of the Month book. None of the January ones particularly interest me at the time, so I skipped the month and ended up with this one. Probably a big mistake on my part, but I try to pick books I normally wouldn't read, and if I'm feeling extra spiteful with myself, books I know are going to be really bad. This book probably fell into that category at this point. The book that I'm referring to is The Winter Sister by Megan Collins, who has her MBA in creative writing, has won several contests, and apparently teaches. So high expectations here. You know what this means, viewer. But in all honesty, this book is only 323 pages and markets itself as a murder mystery novel and a psychological thriller. For housewives, sorry. So when I saw how short it was, I was a little bit concerned that it wouldn't hold much water and we'd be spoon-fed the answers. We were. On top of the characters being named Persephone, Sylvie, Annie, Jill, Missy, and Ben, I was mildly amused. But I mean, I have characters like Katrina, Mael, and and Ilaria, so who am I to judge on the strange inconsistent naming convention? Though it does have 30 chapters, so there's plenty of time to redeem itself, right? So I got 23 pages in and I already knew it was the mayor who did it and he was Persephone's father. Did I mention spoiler? Well, it isn't much of a spoiler if I managed to figure it out. With 300 pages remaining, now is it? Sylvie kept harping on his son Ben being the killer and there was a lot of drivel about fathers and how Sylvie would have liked to known her father, though her mother claimed a one-night stand as her origin story, but at that point I had a feeling it was either Sylvie or Persephone who was actually Will Emery's daughter. Let's just say that my fear of this book being short was ill-founded. It was too long for the drivel it produced. In neat script formatting where it start at odd-numbered pages, I will call this drivel. First of all, the fact that this book is predictable does not make it bad. Nancy Drew has a formula that makes it extremely easy to figure out who the baddie is, and I still enjoyed her as a child, and I enjoyed playing the video games. There are enjoyable murder mystery books out there that you know the answer to early on. It's all about the journey, man. And the journey in this case is a big steaming pile of horse manure. Honestly, there is no right way to write a book. Many people seem to enjoy this book for some godforsaken reason, and I'm not going to say they are wrong. It is all subjective. Just like writing rules are all subjective. But what concerns me is that Meg Collins is a teacher who teaches creative writing. Many of the proses in this book were good. There were a few paragraphs that were utter nonsense and they were just there to add frilly language and a handful of purple proses sprinkled in like salt on steak. There's a lot of blatant clues and red herrings, like apparently our 19-year-old murderer, Ben, has a scar running from his left eyebrow, to, you know, to convince the reader he's a murderer. Durr. Or his cold black eyes of a soulless murderer, which upsets me most about this book is how incredibly stupid the author thinks her readers are. And it shows. I normally don't read the reviews while I'm reading, and I normally don't read the reviews until after I've finished writing my review and ed recording it. But looking at the reviews, most of the one and two star reviews are from crime fiction fans who expressed disappointment about how easy this book was to figure out and how nonsensical it all was and how off the rails it went off about halfway through. This confirms to me that Megan Collins treats her readers like students and she doesn't think very highly of her students. All right, enough about me ranting about how tribed and pointless this book actually is. There were far more three to four star reviews, even five star reviews, so I'm probably alienating enough people who enjoyed this anyway. So let's get into the characters and plot. Before I begin, I have to point out previously that Persephone and Ben are boyfriend and girlfriend friend and brother and sister. So there's an incest warning on this. Sure thanks to Sylvie's warped mind picturing them having sex. You've been warned. Blame Megan Collins for this fuckery. The main character and the point of view character, Sylvia O'Leary, is the product of a one night stand and was 14 years old when her older sister was murdered. Prior to that, she has daddy and mommy issues and thinks her mom hung the moon. She blames herself since she had this agreement with her sister, leaving their bedroom window open, which she sneaks out with her boyfriend, but Sylvie locks it on the night of the murder. She is a painter and ends up as a tattoo artist to remind herself of what she did to her sister and how she painted over her sister's bruises. This is about as realistic as it gets. Moving on. Persephone is the murdered sister who gets her name because her mother wants to protect her from her lineage gets the short end of the stick because she is often neglected by their mother. She is also dating her half-brother Ben when she is murdered, who you know, looks like a serial killer. At 18 years old, Persephone is almost this goddess-like creature to her sister, a force you can't remove, and Sylvie is enamored with her, probably more than her own brother slash boyfriend. So, you know, more incest. She also seems to have some behavioral issues and lashes out, which stems from her father, as he throws a knife at Ben when he's young, rendering this kid looking like a TV villain for the rest of his life. But that's not really explored too much in this book, outside of how she ends up there. The other woman, who is probably my favorite character because, while well, equally delusional as all the other characters, is at least aware of it to a degree and at least 
sarcastic, the waitress from the wrong side of the track, Annie O'Leary. Basically, a man, William Emery, broke her heart as a teenager, and so she mourns him on the 15th of every month. And this is also kind of goes hand in hand with him continuing to toy with her by sending her letters every 15th of the month. Percy Bones thinks it's Sylvie's father. With how much affection Annie gives her youngest daughter, while neglecting her oldest. But Annie has some pretty fucked up reasons for holding her true favorite at arm's length. Oh, and Annie is also an alcoholic, a painkiller addict, and a cancer patient at the time that this book rolls around to bring Sylvie back to Spring Hill, Connecticut, where this all takes place because of reasons. (laughs) Because you know you need somebody to do that. The other main character is Ben Emery, who becomes a nurse, try to heal from the pain, and is again the son of a murderer and the half-brother of his sister, wife, Persephone. He holds a torch for his sister wife for 16 years, but has developed a creepy thing for her younger sister. There are other characters like Sweet Aunt Jill and her daughter Missy, Tommy the creepy stalker, and of course Will Emery himself, the piece of work extraordinaire. Oh, and two detectives that bumble between knowing the law and not knowing the law. But really, basically all you really need to know about anything is that Persephone is murdered in the winter at 18 years old. Everyone blames themselves and each other. Everyone here is a selfish piece of shit, except for Jill. 16 years later, Sylvie is forced to confront this when her mom gets cancer, and it comes out that Will kills Persephone in a fit of rage when his two children refuse to stop dating, despite not telling either of them that they are related. Now, let's get briefly into what I like about the book. I like at the start of each chapter, there is a constellation of stars under it, and nope, that's it. Okay, that's a little bit of a lie. Upon consideration, I do like the horribleness of Annie and Persephone's characters, and I like their dynamic. The only thing that did surprise me in this book was I thought Annie was cold toward Persephone because she reminded Annie of her father, and she disliked her father. Instead, she was afraid of losing Persephone, that she pushed her away. It's a nice tie into the mythology of Persephone and the name. I will give it that, but I don't think it's 100% justified to give a small town character the name Persephone, or the fact that we never learn if Annie really does give her child weird names, or if Sylvie is short for Sylvie. Which is an aside, what is with some authors giving their character nicknames of longer names and never establishing it? For example, Ben being short for Benjamin, it's more likely that Annie is going to shout Sylvie when she's mad or Sylvia Rose, or some other generic, flowery, popular middle name. You get the idea but it's neither here nor there. On to what I didn't like, Sylvie. And since it's shown through her point of view, Megan Collins. There are several things wrong with this writing, so let's get into it briefly. The first is that we are given the obvious clues about how fathers play a role early on, and how Sylvie keeps thinking about how if she had a father, things would be different, or what her father was like, or how she never needed a father because of her mother. There are moments in the book where she has this revelation, like she's thinking back into a story and then dropping it as an afterthought into it, as if she's telling it. The only to see her being shocked at the same revelation. The first thing is that we're giving obvious clues on how the father plays a role early on and how Sylvie keeps thinking about how if she had a father, things would be different or what her father would be like or how she never needed a father because she had her mother. Which brings me into the next point. There are moments in this book where she has this revelation like she is thinking back into the story and dropping it as an afterthought into it as she is telling it to somebody else only to see her shocked by the same revelation page later and the frilly purple poses that accompany it. So we too must feel the chill going down our spine or the goosebumps bubbling up over our skin. Let's go back to the concept that you can have a good mystery with predictable writing for a minute, okay? Sylvie has this ability to think she's so right while being so wrong is also grating. Coupled with the fact that the revelations are bland. If she could admit it, sure. She has to carry on like she has this new information that she picked up right away in the heat of the moment with her mother and is telling the reader. Like how Will is Persephone's father when she discovers small notes that Will wrote Annie. It is so linear and easy to see where it's going without the buildup of watching for clues coming together, but instead of watching an arrogant character stumble upon them haphazardly, only to throw a quote, brilliant, unquote, guess out there. It doesn't make the reading fun. You aren't discovering the clues together with the character, understanding their thought process, because the clues are spoon-fed to you and then treated like you should be shocked by them. And as I have said enough times, but this is lazy writing. The average reader has an eighth grade reading level. I'm not trying to belittle anyone with this remark or imply, if you like this book, you're dumb. But the fact is, the national average reading level is eighth grade. This is what most publishers try to have their authors shoot for to get a wider range of audience and not alienate them. The average writer writes for a fifth grade reading level. No disrespect Hemingway who falls under this. Megan and Colin writes for a fifth grade reading level. There is nothing wrong with that. Again, Hemingway wrote at a fifth grade reading level, but she acts like she's writing for a college reading level and no one 
can read her transparent writing, so she has to spell it out for them. It's insulting. You should feel insulted. You have the right to feel insulted. If you don't and can enjoy this book without feeling insulted, like so many, ignore this remark. Likes are subjective. And all that matters is what you like. You're probably more offended by me than you are by Meg Collins, but since you're clicking on my channel, let's continue with the do's and don'ts of writing. Another frustrating thing for me is Sylvie's insistence of knowing the law at 14 years old better than law enforcement officers. So when you have a trauma like your sister dying, you are often emotionally and mentally stunted at that age, unless you get therapy to help you move forward. So her acting like childish and at the same at 14 years old and 30 years old is not bothersome to me. But what is worrisome is that she keeps insisting Detective Fally Parker are hiding something from her. You know, not that they're expected to follow protocol and keep important clues at bay. I don't expect the general public to know these sort of things, but true crime fans and crime drama fans can pick up on it. And I'm really not a fan of the implication that all police are corrupt. And some of the true crime communities love to imply this. And yes, there are corrupt police officers. The LA and New York PD, for example, have been notoriously corrupt in different decades. But this whole mistrust of the police while insisting she knows more and is wrong is grating after a while, especially when there's not a hint of irony that this is something that the author does not think or want the reader to think. I really don't need paragraphs and paragraphs, even chapters, on how incompetent a woman stuck in her teens thinks the police are. I mean, Sylvie, you're into your sister's ex-boyfriend who you held a grudge over for 16 years. Are you the best judge of character there, lady? Also, don't get me started on how Collins has one of the detectives, Hannah Folly, apologize to Sylvie and even leave a voicemail apologizing again at the end. I know Folly was never the most professional detective and quit six years ago, but damn woman. As much as police are people too, wasting two multiple paragraph sections on this on this offers nothing. Well, I guess this book has to be filled out somehow. Not to get too sidetracked, but with these kind of characters like Sabrina from The Ditter List, it is very hard to tell if the author is trying to show that no one is perfect and act like this is someone that is a person with flaws, or if they actually seen their main character as an infallible heroine who sees the world perfectly. Because these women, the desperate stalker who believes her soulmates with this one guy, or this girl who wants her mom to move on from her sister's death but can't shake it herself, are not character natures or type. They are the creation of stuffy old white men who don't know the first thing about women and think we are all boy crazy. It is insulting, especially coming from a fellow woman. You don't have to be feminist and you can have your blonde bimbo, but for the love of God, create a realistic character, not the cool brooding misunderstood girl who is far more intelligent than everyone else that you thought you were. You're over 30. Your characters are over 30. Both of you should have grown out of it. So Meg Collins has her MBA and works at Boston University in the creative writing department. This is going to sound harsh, but she really should take advantage of that and take some creative writing classes because of Jesus. And again, it's hard sometimes to separate the overdramatic character with the writer's delusions that they are making a realistic character that actually does realistic things characters do, which is hard by the way. But it is hard to take Sylvie seriously. It makes me put down the book and roll my eyes when she says things like I find on page 105 and 111 of this book. Let's read these two excerpts, shall we? The first is in relationship to Parker stonewalling any of her questions about the investigation, namely Ben and his status as a suspect for abusing Persephone. <sighs> I can feel him building a wall between us, one that clearly I won't be able to penetrate. But why would Parker need to hide the truth from me? Why was he more concerned about protecting my sister's abuser than arresting her killer? So the writing in this paragraph, you're trying to lead the reader into making more of a situation than it actually is and make there something else more sinister than going on in actuality. Basically a red herring. The second excerpt is her response to finding that Ben left right roses at Persephone's grave, which as an aside, he had, had been the only one visiting it in 16 years, and you admitted you had to search for your own sister's grave prior to this, so girl, shut up. Still holding the bouquet at Persephone's grave, I realized my grip had crinkled the plastic wrap. I dropped the rose into the snow and took a few steps backward. Any peace I might have found now lost. Hello, run on sentence. My eyes darted around the cemetery, my body tense as strings of a tightly tuned guitar. Oh look, comma splice. Was everything Ben did now? Becoming a nurse? Leaving flowers? Just a calculated effort to try and soothe his guilt? Or, I wondered, the thought sliding through me, sliding through me like a stiff, paralyzing drug. Was he sending me a message, telling me he wasn't going to disappear, that even though Persephone was dead, he wouldn't leave her or my family alone? Okay, first of all, can we please acknowledge that three out of the five sentences there have dreadful comma slice. You can argue that it's fine since it's in the first person and a stream of thought, but girl, it's okay to make sentences like. Not every sentence has to be a min minimum of 15 words long. Anyway, 
Collins does this a lot through her entire book where she puts a more likely thought into Sylvie's head, then it ends it with a more outrageous thought without a sense of irony. That results in me finishing every chapter by closing the book, exclaiming how extremely idiotic it all was, and then cleaning until I'm no longer annoyed enough to not read the next chapter. It's supposed to invoke suspense. With me, though, is make me look at the main character and the writer like they're idiots. Which is fair because I think I'm an idiot. To hype up the corruption of the police for stonewalling you and not give your answers right away then and there, or to imply that the guy becoming a nurse to harass you like he knew your mom was going to get cancer is absurd. I kept waiting for something to happen with the corruption of the police outside of the mayor. Just like I kept waiting for it to come out that Ben had literally pestered this family after Persephone's death to try to make sense of it. Nope. You didn't even go to the funeral. But the murderer did. Which is in line with actual murderers. When it didn't happen though, I waited for it to drop that Sylvie had an undiagnosed acute paranoia or something to explain the absurdity of these paragraphs. We only got absurder though. More on that in a minute. Your sister died. The murderer was never found. By default, I have sympathy. As a person with generalized anxiety, I perfectly understand bouts of paranoia that are utterly unfounded, but you feel them all the same. Sylvie had a traumatic event happen to her. She blames herself for her sister's murder, and rightfully so. She is also stuck with being in the mindset of a 14-year-old girl and deflecting the blame onto everyone else to lessen her guilt. This makes a good character, adding on the insult she had to endure before, and after her sister's death, she has a right to be paranoid about the small town covering up things. It seems like neither her or her sister had many friends from the start, so I'm okay with the angle Collins is trying to go for. What I'm not okay with is the execution. What does not make a good character is drivel. To sit there and try to transparently hype up the reader into thinking Sylvie is in far more danger than she actually is. The murder happened 16 years ago. Ben is not lurking in the background waiting to take out another O'Leary girl through new diabolical means. Because no one is probably lurking in the background trying to take out an O'Leary girl. And real quick, as an aside, she was ne never in any danger at any point in this book. Even when she was facing her sister's killer, she can quietly walk away again to her car and call the police with absolutely no one trying to stop her. Because she did. <laughs> ben probably wants to move on because if he actually did it, it was probably accidental. But no, Sylvie knows he did it because he has dark eyes, a scar, and gives her sister bruises. Which I'm going to be real with you, all can easily be explained away by rough sex, by con two consensual adults, or a clotting disorder based on the fact that they're typically on her wrist, hip, or collarbone. Oh, and the one on her side might be him punching her, which I will give Sylvie that. But then you gotta remember, Persephone is prone to violent fits when she doesn't get her way. So it's more likely Ben was restraining her during one of them, and she's the abusive one. By the way, Collins treats her readers based like idiots, but lacks creativity, and that's the reason, by the way. Can I even call this a psychological thriller or a cold case novel when I can see straight through it like an open window? Because, by the way, it was consensual, like my first intuition told me. I mean, who would pass up the chance not to make a character fall for her, her dead sister's ex-boyfriend? Not Collins. The best way I can describe this book is this. This book is a scene of a light, feathery purple mountain range miles off. The reader is looking at it straight on and can see the dimples on the mountain made by the tree line. It's a clear blue day, not a single cloud in the sky, and Miss Collins is telling us it's blizzarding out with no visibility. Ha! She cackles. You cannot see the mountains. I have obscured them by the plot, and I am, only I know the way. But the overhype of this book is just bad. The red herrings are bad. I have taken one creative writing class, and I know this is bad. And remember, she teaches it. Let's move on to my final point, shall we? Don't have sex scenes if you can't commit to saying the word penis. Like I said, Sylvie and Ben end up having a thing that is sort of implied to continue at the end. Sylvie goes from one day thinking he is her sister's killer to fucking him and thinking he is the killer again. But the point is, if you're going to go here with your writing, don't make it creepy and incestuous. Or at the very least, don't make it this way. Let's take a pause to read pages 253 and 266, shall we? So here's how the whole sex scene goes down. This is after they both express they miss Persephone. I kissed him then. Without thinking or understanding, I pressed my mouth against his. I cupped his face and felt the ridge of his scar beneath my fingers. He had been wounded there, hurt by a parent who was supposed to only love him, and I kissed him harder for that. I could feel a surprise in the shape of his mouth, the initial stiffness of his lip, but then he kissed me back. Lifting his hand to cradle my neck, my nerves became to electrify. Something in my body roared back to life. I gripped him closer, pulling him down with me to the bed. I felt the weight of him, his chest rising and falling in tempo with my own. I wrapped my legs around him, fastening his body to mine. Whew, breather, please. His lips were softer than I would have expected, and as our mouths moved together, breathy and slick, I slipped my hands under the back of his sweater, feeling the head of his skin against my palms as I pulled him closer. Yes, this is one sentence. Give me a moment to breathe again. Okay. His thumb stroked my cheek as he kissed me and kissed me again. I struggled with his belt 
trying to unbuckle it without unthreading my lips from his. He leaned back, his breathing heavy and rhythmic. He peeled off his sweater, undid his belt, and slid out of his pants. I tucked my shirt over my head and pulled my own jeans and underwear down together. When he came back to me, his skin was already beating with sweat. He wrapped his fingers around the strap of my bra and slipped them down over my shoulder, kissing each inch of my body, he revealed. Oh my, I'm blushing like a nun right now. I didn't want his mouth that far from mine. I put my hands on the side of his face and guided him back to my lip. We kissed each other again and again and again and again until he finally entered me. I gasped, his mouth trailing down my neck where he breathed and hard against my skin. I really must be a grammar matron because this turns me right off, but there's more. As I pressed my fingers into his shoulder blades, as I turned my head to run my lips along his scar, I didn't stop to wonder why tears dampened my cheek. I only thought of all the parts of my sister that Ben alone had known, parts secret and mysterious, parts that I had never been able to reach. Then I felt the rhythm of him inside me for the miracle it was. With every gentle but insistent thrust. He was pushing Persephone back, back, back into me. So yeah, had sex with girlfriend's little sister to remember Persephone. I honestly can't say there is really any part of the scene that does anything to the story, except for to pander anyone who ships the main characters for being male and female and male characters, and open up that deranged possibility. Or to meet the quota of one sex scene for Book of the Month book, I really don't know. The disturbing part is, is I can tell Sylvie is trying to be her sister in the situation, or having a sex fantasy about her, because this happened happens when she learns about Will. I stopped, my mind pummeling off the track. It was on and hitching it on to another. She was his too, she had just said, but Ben was also his, and Ben and Persephone had been each other's. Ben had probably put his hand on her cheek when he kissed her, like he'd done to me. He had probably run his fingers through her hair, grazed his teeth against the skin of her shoulder, and just as his tension and desire began to brim over, he must have pressed his hip bones against Persephone's, then drained himself into her, gasping and grunting for breath. I will give Collins this. She has such colorful language and avoid using the three letter words sex <laughs> but ew i don't know the grossest part of this fantasy the fact that sylvie is pinching it or the draining himself into her i need a hot acid shower after this one thanks and then the book gets even more off the rails with this ridiculousness from there it's like the big villain confrontation and the reveal which is rather uninspiring or all that spectacular but to be fair it was revealed in the first 20 pages and we are 300 pages later so yeah, I'm not going to even recommend this book in the slightest. If you liked it, that's great. But I truly don't think a book would annoy me more than The Dinnerless. When it came to the pretentiousness and the lack of self-awareness, while marketing itself as something riveting. But here we are. And the best part of this is, is Meg Collins has another quote, dark thriller, unquote, insert eye roll emoji here, book coming out August 2020 of this year. I'm definitely going to pre-order it because let's take a moment to read the description for a minute. The author of the suspenseful, atmospheric, and completely riveting, Megan Miranda says, the debut of Winter Sister returns with a darkly thrilling novel about a woman who comes to believe she has connection to a decades old kidnapping. Now that the victim is gone missing again, begins frantic search to learn what happened in the past. When Fern Douglas sees the news about Astrid Sullivan, a 34-year-old missing woman from Maine, she is positive that she knows her. Fern's husband is sure it is because Astrid's famous kidnapping, an equally famous return 20 years ago. But Fern has no memory of that, even though it happened an hour outside of her New Hampshire hometown. And when Astrid appears in Fern's reoccurring nightmare, one in which a girl reaches out to her pleading, Fern fears that it might not be a dream at all, but a memory. Back at her childhood home to help her father pack for a move, Fern purchased a copy of Astrid's recently published memoir, which may have only provoked her original kidnapper to abduct her again. As she reads through each chapter and visits the people and places within, she discovers more evidence than that she has an unsettling connection to the missing woman. With the help of her psychologist father, Ferns digs deeper, hoping to find evidence that her connection to Astrid can help the police look Locator. But when Fern discovers more about her own past than she's ever bargained for, the disturbing truth will change both of their lives forever. Featuring Megan Collins' signature dark, tense, and completely absorbing, said by Booklist, prose and plenty of shocking twists and turns behind the red door is an arresting thriller that will haunt you long after the last page's turn. Yeah, this is actually a thing written to hype her book. <laughs> Gag. The only potential redeeming quality is this is she probably didn't write this particularly herself despite being on her website but this alone could be dissected for why it's bad but i'm telling you right now i'm sighting her husband or her father and fern is kidnapped victim herself transparent as a window i understand synopses are supposed to be somewhat cheesy and eye grabbing but this is just an ass hat for collins and head pats for the dumb little readers i can't with this woman i literally can't kate morton you have a formidable rival when it comes to inflated ego it's honestly books like this and the clockmaker's daughter that are more useful to me because it teaches me what i like and don't like and allow me to figure out 
for myself rather than falling into these pitfalls of thinking I am a better writer than I actually am. And more importantly, make sure that I'm creating well-rounded, believable characters. It is an extreme push to continue blabbering on into the abyss of YouTube and get my self-confidence up. Though I suppose it's easy when it's just me and YouTube. Next up, we're going to be reviewing the book of the month's book of the year for 2019, Daisy Jones and the Six by Taylor Jenkins Reid and her ghostwriters. I'm going to disclose this early on since I didn't get a book of the for January. I ended up getting two books in March and this was not one of them, though I don't know. Though I do know I bri very briefly considered it for half a second, so it was on my top third choice. So we'll see how this goes. But I tend to like the next book a whole lot better after train wrecks like this. Anyways, so see you next time.